Hi, my name is Anna Sternschus, and I would like to start by saying huge thank you to GHI for giving me an opportunity to spend the last six months thinking about Yiddish songs created in the Soviet Union during the Holocaust. My project focuses on how vulnerable people lived through the violence during World War II, specifically in ghettos located in the territory of the contemporary Ukraine and parts of Moldova, an area known during World War II as Transnistria. I'm focusing on ghettos located in Tulchin, Pechora, Bershad, Shargarad, Zabokrich, and a few others. In those ghettos, prisoners often died in large numbers from starvation, diseases, and from cold. As you can see here on your slide, there's a picture of the snow. And that is because this winter uh, from 1941 to 1942 was one of the coldest uh, winters in recorded history. And people died uh, from diseases and just from cold caused by this weather. Um, some of the most vulnerable victims of these ghettos were people who couldn't work. Um, a lot of uh, ghettos served as an important part of Nazi military industry, where people made and mended clothes, processed wood, excavated turf, and more. The trouble is that this aspect of the history of the Holocaust, Holocaust in Transnistria, is one of the least studied. And what made it difficult to study is, among other things, is the fact that there are no photographs from the time. Guards, prisoners uh, did not take photos of these ghettos or concentration camps, and neither did, for some reason, a Red Army uh, soldiers or journalists even embedded with the Red Army um, as they liberated these uh, places. So it's very hard for us to talk about history, which we can't at least partially visualize. We do have survivors, and um, those survivors after the war ended up in the Soviet Union most of the time. In the Soviet Union, it was very difficult, sometimes not really acceptable, to talk about Jewish victims of World War II separate from Soviet uh, victims of World War II. After all, the Soviet Union did lose 27 million people in the war, so every Soviet citizen lost someone there. And um, sometimes it was even dangerous to talk about uh, uh, specific Jewish losses because uh, um, Jews could be accused either in uh, building Jewish nationalism that was against the law or simply persecuted for the fact that they survived because the idea was that if they if they survived it must have been because they collaborated with the German army. So the country looks like this full with ruins. This is a monument to the war destruction in Stalingrad and um, this is a photograph uh, of Soviet uh, Jewish uh, journalists uh, collecting evidence of Nazi atrocities in Kiev. And, um, you know, the, the uh, persecution of uh, perpetrators of crimes uh, was part of the legal sphere, but commemoration of these crimes somehow went away from public life. By the time survivors were able to speak about what happened to them, most of them have immigrated to United States, Germany, Israel, and a little bit in Canada. Once they came to those countries, they were sort of eager to tell their stories, but there were no listeners. Many of them could not speak in English. And their family members were new immigrants who were often busy building their new lives in their new countries and didn't have time to talk to their parents and grandparents about the past. But the thing is, um, most people who went through these ghettos and camps did not live to see the end of the war, let alone to have children or grandchildren. So how do we tell their stories? During my work in the Ukrainian archives, I found an interesting source that filled some of these gaps and answered some of these questions. 
These are songs created in Ukraine uh, by ghetto prisoners. These were not intellectuals or journalists or writers or professional composers. These were children who ended up in these ghettos and camps not knowing why they were punished and what would happen to them tomorrow. They also knew, at least some of them did, that they were living for the important moment of history and they needed to document it. The only way many of them knew how is through creating songs. Ethnomusicologist Moisey Berigovsky collected some of the songs in late 1944 when he and his colleagues traveled for the newly liberated Ukraine and identified survivors. Later, however, Berigovsky was arrested now by Stalin's government for supposedly fostering Jewish nationalism and all his work uh, during the wartime was seized and completely untouched by historians and ethnomusicologists. Now, Berigovsky has worked a lot on collecting Yiddish music before the war, and thankfully that archive is very well known and has been studied both by scholars in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Union, and abroad in the United States and Israel. But the wartime project of Moisey Berigovsky that actually recorded songs as of people who were living through um, ghettoization, through concentration camps, those songs were thought to be lost to history until they were found in these archives. And um, Berigovsky was arrested. He was released from jail in 1956. This is a photograph of him two years after that and also three years before he died of lung, lung cancer. But you know, the, he didn't know that this work survived and he died thinking that uh, this disappeared, this material has disappeared. But in the early 2000s, librarians of the Ukrainian National Library, led by Ludmila Sholokhova, who you see on the photo, Dr. Ludmila Sholokhova, found those documents. And um, I am the first historian to work with them. And uh, for the for, uh, past few years, I worked together with several musicians, most importantly, Psoy Karalenko, who you see on the photo here uh, with myself, to bring the songs back to life to their audience. We recorded a CD called Yiddish Glory, uh, which was nominated for the Grammy. We performed um, all around the world. There's a little bit of posters here for you to look at. And we even performed in um, uh, Kremlin, uh, which was ironic, of course, because the order of Berigovsky's arrest was signed there. And now we were uh, on that stage of the Great uh, Hall, I think it's called the uh, Great uh, uh, Kremlin Palace, performing these songs and talking about Berigovsky. And I did say uh, on stage that this is the place where Berigovsky was, uh, where the order of Berigovsky's arrest was signed. And this program was broadcast on Russian national television. So we continue this mission of uh, bringing the songs to audiences, recording new, new materials uh, from the collection. Uh, and it's very exciting to be able to kind of uh, think about history in the context of music and working with artists. But this fellowship gave me an opportunity and the chance to actually to sit and think and to focus on these songs as historical sources. Sometimes the only ones from places where Jews were killed in Transnistria. And more I looked at these songs, more I realized how their authors must have sensed that their music would be the only source of knowledge created by victims rather than perpetrators from these ghettos in Transnistria. For example, we don't have a single photo of a concentration camp named Pechora, located in Vinitsa region of Ukraine um, from the wartime, but we do have many songs created in Pechora, mostly by children that are preserved in Berigovsky's archive. Pechora was one of the scariest places in Transnistria. It was located in the town with the same name in Vinitsa region of Ukraine. Romanians uh, occupied it at the end of July of 1941. And in September of 1941, the Romanian authorities converted the summer estate of uh, 
aristocratic Potoki family in Pechora, which also served before the war as a sanatorium for Red Army officers, into a death camp for Jews. It was fenced, hard to get out, and above all, no food was delivered there. The goal was death through starvation. 4,000 people died there between 1941 and 1943. Prisoners called this place the dead loop, referring to the closed fences and to the fact that it was on a high steep shore of River Book. There are no photos of Pechora from the time, as I mentioned, but there are many of the present. In fact, the ones that you're looking at right now, I found them on TripAdvisor. After some time, this uh, beautiful site became a sanatorium again, and now it advertises spa, massages, uh, walks, and unique air um, that, um, that vacationers can enjoy. There is a little plaque hidden not to upset those vacationers that commemorates what happened here seven, uh, well, by now 80 years ago, almost uh, 80 years ago, when thousands of Jews from nearby towns were deported and uh, died here from starvation, typhus, and other diseases. Now, Pichora was almost fully staffed by local guards, not Romanian soldiers, and uh, like other ghettos, like ghettos in Bersha to Shargaran. The guards had enormous power over prisoners. They could kill them or turn blind eye when someone tried to smuggle over the fence and things like this. Especially cruel was a man named Lukian Smitansky, a short, angry man, often drunk, who was known to shoot people for fun, taking bribes and not honoring them, making people trip on purpose and laughing at them and other examples of sadist behavior. Yiddish songs created in Pechora pay meticulous attention to everyday life uh, episodes of Pechora. Sometimes they include specific day and even the time within that day when an atrocity or a pogrom took place. They very often name villains, uh, corrupt Jewish officials within ghettos, and especially cruel non-Jewish guards. They describe episodes of violence and crimes, and they do so that this, uh, the story rhymes so you can sing it. One such song is called the Song of Pechora Lager, a song of Pechora Camp. It was recorded from a number of former prisoners of Pechora at that time in 1940s. And um, um, I put the words, the translation of uh, these documents on the slide for you. And we also will get an incredible privilege to hear the actual sound recording that Berigovsky made in 1944. Just a few years ago, oh, sorry, just a few months ago, the Vernaski Library found those uh, um, recordings and digitized them and put them online for us to listen to. So this is how the song of Pechora Camp sounded uh, to Berigovsky. Oh, yeah, it is giving me 
The audio recording ends where it saw it end, but the archival text has a number of other verses, and I put them on the screen here for you. Uh, you know, and uh, these are the, the, this is the, the handwritten document that you see. This is a, a second page of verses of this song, and uh, what follows next is much more kind of detailed description of atrocities with naming guards and uh, naming people uh, who are responsible for that. Specifically, Lukyan Smetansky is named as a person who was especially cruel. I don't know why this part is not digitized. Maybe it's because uh, the library had limited resources and only digitized the first three verses of a song rather than the entire song. Uh, or maybe it's because Berigovsky himself did not audio record the entire text, not to jeopardize that kid who was singing it for him, because I, even then I think it was already understood that um, it was dangerous to talk about the fact that not all Soviet citizens were fighting against Nazi Germany during the war and talking about the local villain uh, was somewhat not safe. But the point is that by hand he wrote down all the verses of the song. And now you can hear how uh, the song continues. Um, it is going to be performed for you by uh, vocalist Isaac Rosenberg, a U of T student, who is accompanied by uh, Beth Silver, Sergio Pop, and Julian Milkis, the Canadian virtuoso musicians. <laughs> Dieser Reus mit Danski mit der Kreuzer Bix, oi, 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 Bix. Zugegangen zwei unschuldige Jeden, hat der See geschossen, gar umsicht. Hat der See geschossen, gar umsicht. During JHI-funded leave, I spent quite a bit of time reading and listening to extensive testimonies of survivors of Pechora, the ones that were recorded already in a later day in between 1990s and 2000s. And some of the episodes described in the songs uh, emerge in these interviews, but others didn't. Many survivors, for example, spoke about how important the music was to them uh, in Pechora, but none of them could remember specific songs. My observation from this interview is this, I heard a lot of stories of a lot of atrocities and a lot of names and circumstances of survival. And I want to say this, that if I were asked to summarize those stories into an executive summary, a short, I don't know, like a 30 second or, or one minute long um, statement, I don't think I would have done a better job than the some anonymous kid in 1944 who put together the song about the atrocities that took place in Pechora. I will finish my presentation with one last song. I will finish my presentation with one last song, also written in Pechora, also by a child whose name was Josef Broverman. At the age of 12, he lost his parents who died in Pechora from typhus. On that day, he wrote the song in which he wanted to commemorate them and also the beautiful town of the nearby Tulchin where he was born and where he grew up. Tulchin lost almost its entire pre-war population in the war. There were um, very few survivors, and um, most of them were deported on this road that you see on your screen from Tulchin to Pechora, where they uh, died. Yosef's voice did not survive for us, just the words of his song. But here it is, performed for you by Canadian 
singer Sophie Melman, accompanied by Russian trio Loiko, led by Sergei Yerdenko. <laughs> Menschen fallen wie die Flingen, nur verhungert und verkehrt. Unser Mucke, unser Zorn, wissen wir die ganze Welt. Jemand soll nicht einfach fallen, dort von Schul nicht jedes Blick. Bosse wird das Sinn vergessen in Europa. Thank you for listening, both me and this music. It is my hope that soon, okay, fine, soon-ish, I will be able to complete the draft of the manuscript on this topic, the one that will give voice to people who lived through the violence of the Holocaust and who managed to preserve their experiences for us through music that gave them strength and continues to inspire. Thank you.